السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ ان الحمد للہ نحمد و نستعین و نستغفر و نؤمن به و نتوکل علیہ و نعود و نعود بالله من شرور انفسنا و من سیئیات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مدل له ومن يدلله فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وهل الأغدة من لساني يبقه قولي اللهم من فعني بما علمتني وعلمني ما ينفعني وزدني علما so we start in the next session the 40th session of the uh, seerah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam recapping on the session previous session number 39 we'll just go through the brief on that one the first we addressed was the prohibition of alcohol this was the time when the third phase of the on the consumption of alcohol was revealed to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and alcohol was made haram from then on immediately after the expulsion of banu nadir the next was the ignorant women of yathrib who were having too many miscarriages were ready to make their sons as jews and uh, because they felt that the jews were much better and many of their sons were made into jews and later on they were asked to leave judaism and come back to islam so when the women had this particular problem and especially after some of the jews were sent out of madina the elders started pressurizing their children their sons to cut back to islam it was then that allah subhanahu wa taala revealed the ayah that there is no compulsion in religion from this we start to find out what is it that gave birth to secularism the circumstances that led to this was mainly due to the dominance of the church in all aspects of life it was to such an extent that religion was feared and we know fully well there is no such thing in islam after the uh, expulsion of uh, banu nadira we saw what was the reaction of banu quraida the tribe refused to accept islam just because their leader did not accept islam then we came to the second battle of badr no war actually took place since the quraish did not go to badr and the muslims were declared victorious ultimately we spoke of the marriage of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to umm salama and how beautifully the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam clarified the three issues that she had raised before accepting his offer for marriage then we went to ghazwa datur rika that is the campaign of bandages here also no fighting was involved there was no war as such but it was at this time that the ayah on the prayer of fear was revealed and we also came across sal- the salah of abbad ibn bishar radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu how he continued in his salah till he completed his salah even though he was struck by arrows this was his concentration at that time can we have the next slide please now considering the developments that took place around madina and uh, actually what happened was the allied forces around madina started becoming enemy forces so after the battle of ahad the various clans as you see in the map in the area surrounding madina were waiting for an opportunity to attack madina next slide please one of these was ghazwat tumatul jandal now this tumatul jandal is the name of a place which is north of madina on the route to biladusham that's syria 
Why did the Prophet ﷺ travel so far to Dumatul Jandal, especially considering that this place is very close to Syria? It was because the Prophet ﷺ was told that there was a huge group of people at the Dumatul Jandal, which was almost like a town, a colony, where criminals and bandits, notorious for their criminal activities, used to stay. What they would do, they would rob, loot and murder people who would pass by that area. And it was to such an extent that they became a real threat. And along with this, they had also a marketplace there. So the criminals from that area had set their eyes on Madina, thinking that they can come to Madina also and start their looting activities. So they considered the possibilities of picking up an operation and coming closer to Madina, moving closer to Madina. The Prophet ﷺ wanted to let them know that Madina was a city of Muslims and the Muslims would defend the, and protect it and wouldn't allow anyone to bring their criminal activity. Thereby, they, they, they would become a threat to Islam, the Muslims, and ultimately the peace in Medina. The Prophet ﷺ gathered a thousand Muslims and he traveled out in the direction of Dumatul Chandar. Uh, this was during summer. So they traveled mostly in the night and they used to rest during the day. The Prophet ﷺ had hired an expert guide named Madkur from the type of another tribe of Banu Udra because Madkur knew the region very well and he was able to lead the way. Can we have the next slide, please? Now, see here, this slide was shown earlier in the previous class, but now we are showing that red arrow indicates Jumadul Jandal, uh, Dumatul Jandal. You see how far it is from Madina. The next slide, please. When they got close to Dumatul Jandal, Madkur saw that there were some animals that belonged to Bani Tamim. So the Muslims didn't find anybody there. So the Prophet ﷺ sent scouts in all directions for any news on where they were actually were. They came back to the Prophet ﷺ and said, we are not finding anybody in this region. We can't find anything. The Muslims stayed there for a few days and ultimately there was no one. They had to return back. Muhammad ibn Maslama, a very devout and reliable Sahabi, he found one person from the gang and brought this man to the Prophet The Prophet asked the man, where did the whole gang go? Where did they all go? They used to be in this place, now where are they? The man said, they found out that you had come very close, so they ran away from here. The Prophet said, okay, but while we are here, we might as well fulfill the primary task for which we traveled. He offered the man a seat and spoke to him about Islam, invited him to believe in Allah. The man took his shahada. Alhamdulillah. With no war, with no people around of the enemy, the Muslims returned to Madina. The expedition lasted for about a month. And as I said, there was no fighting during this particular journey. Can we go to the uh, next one, please? Now, yeah, Ansari, a leader of the Ansari, his name was Saad ibn Ubada. One of the people who was on this particular campaign with the Prophet ﷺ was an Ansari named Saad ibn Ubada. Now, he was someone that the Prophet trusted a lot. And before the Prophet ﷺ migrated to Madina, Saad was someone that the Prophet appointed as a leader of the city in Madina. And the Prophet was able to benefit from him, really leading the community, organizing the committee, uh, community while waiting for the arrival of the Prophet ﷺ to Madina. Now, during this particular expedition, Saad's mother passed away. 
when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam returned to madina he knew about this he went and did the janaza prayer at her grave now this was a sign of respect the kindness and generosity that the prophet showed to one of the leaders of the community there is a lesson that we can take from this we see that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam cared for everyone individually also when that there, there are people working with you they are serving you and they are serving your cause dedicating their own talents and abilities in the direction of what the cause is it's also very important that we value these people and give them special time and attention and it's very important that we serve the people that are serving along with us and that we show them the type of loyalty that they are showing to us it's a very big lesson we find that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam specially went and gave attention to sad's mother and also imagine the great honor that sad felt the dignity and the respect that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam gave him after re returning from this campaign the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam remained in madina for the rest of the year next we come to the expectation of banu al mustaliq also called as al muraisi this was another major incident that occurred in this in this expedition who was banu al mustaliq this was a tribe who lived near a pond called muraisi next to the water pool, water pool which was between makka and madina they had one of the most prestigious idols of arabia the manat three of the main idols that we had mentioned the lat al the uzza and manat so manat was in this particular place so when the quraish attacked madina this tribe sided with the quraish against the muslims and also helped them in the battle of uhud the leader of this banu al mustaliq was one al harith ibn abi dirar who actually wanted to launch a surprise attack against the muslims why was he keen on doing it because this tribe was being hurt economically from the tensions that were going on between the muslims and the quraish they were also being affected in a bad manner so when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam heard of this he sent a sahabi by the name of buraida ibn al husayb so buraida went there he pre pretended to be a bedouin and spoke to the leader and then he asked the leader about his intentions when buraida got to know about the intentions what did he do he quietly returned during the night he escaped from that place came to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and informed the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam about the uh, planning of this particular tribe so this leader had no clue of what was happening therefore when the muslims launched a, launched an attack on this particular place he was taken up by surprise the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had rallied together about 700 sahaba more than them and he did a, a surprise attack on this particular tribe and it the victory was very easy you will note here that the hypocrites joined the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in this attack what was the reason why did they do that because it was so easy there was no possibility of a war at all and the munafiq knew abdullah ibn ubay was also there who participated they knew very well that they would have nothing to do they are going to get a victory in any case so when this banu al mustaliq saw the muslims coming they almost immediately surrendered only a handful of banu al mutallaq died the remaining people all surrendered in this particular thing an incident took place where an ansar accidentally kills a muhajir at that time they were not able to make out probably because of the distance or because of the people around but the muslims were concerned from this campaign not a single muslim was uh, killed except that this ansar 
accidentally misfired and killed one of the Mohajis. So what happened? This, uh, the person who was killed was Mikhias. His name was Mikhias. His brother Hisham, I'm sorry, the other way around. Hisham was the person who was killed and Mikhias was his brother. When Mikhias heard of this, what he did was he pretended to accept Islam. He went to Medina and he demanded the blood money from the Prophet ﷺ, which is about 100 camels. As this was a Shari issue, the Prophet ﷺ agreed and gave him 100 camels. But that same night, what this fellow did was, he killed the Ansari who killed his brother. He took the 100 camels and he fled back to Makkah. Look at the trick that he played. Next slide, please. Now, because of this, it resulted in a dispute between the Ansars and the Muhajirs. It is mentioned that one Ansari and one Muhajir amongst the young men from both the sides went to collect some water for the caravan. On the way, they started disputing and this resulted in a fist fight. Already there was one incident that took place. Now here is the other incident. They just went to pick up some water and they got into a dispute and they began fighting. So what did the Muhajir do? He immediately started shouting, Oh, Muhajirun, come and help me, come and help me. The Ansar on his part, he also shouted, Oh, Ansar, come and help me. It resulted in both the groups coming forward and each one on their own side, ready for some uh, ready for beating up each other. And weapons were drawn. To that extent, it became difficult. Now, what is the lesson that we get from it? What, what did the Prophet ﷺ do? He heard all this commotion. He rushed out to, from his tent. And when he was told about the incident, the Prophet ﷺ said, are you going back to the cause of the jahiliya, the ignorant? Leave it. For it is munt, uh, muntina. In Arabic, this word means disgusting. It's filthy. It's rotting. What are you doing? So he used a very harsh word when he was addressing these people. Even for the best of the Muslims, the Sahaba and all them, the potential exists that they can lose their tempers, that they could flare up. This is what we see in the humanity of the Sahaba. They were not angels. They can get angry. And as we know, Iblis is just waiting to divide the Muslim Ummah in this particular manner. Look into our own surroundings. How at the smallest of the excuses, one Muslim is ready to attack another Muslim. And we also see that the Prophet ﷺ called this ethnic division the dispute amongst them as rotten and filthy. This shows that dividing ourselves in over any divisions is something which is considered very filthy. It is a human nature, but it is very disgusting. What is especially noteworthy in this division is that this division between Ansar and Muhajir was unknown to both of them five years ago. Imagine how they were five years ago. This was something brand new that came in. It did not happen before. And what does the Quran say about it? If you go to Surah Tawbah, Surah number 9, Ayah number 100, the interpretation reads, and the first to embrace Islam of the Muhajirun and the Ansar, and also those who followed them exactly, that is in Iman, Allah is well pleased with them as they are well pleased with him. He has prepared for them gardens under which rivers flow to dwell therein forever. That is a supreme success. So Allah referred to this division as Muhajirs and Ansars. Full stop. And what was the common thing between two of them? Iman. Yet what happens is this can be misused and abused as we see right now. 
this particular division that takes place itself becomes un-Islamic. If our Prophet ﷺ said that these divisions that are khunarnik are filthy and disgusting, if it's misused in this, in this manner. Yes, there can be divisions, but how you use them is what is important. Okay, how about the divisions that are imaginary that we people, we Muslims make in ourselves? It's all man-made. How are they following in the scheme of things? This clearly shows us the filth and inherent un-Islamic uh, concept that we still have regarding racism and social divide. It still prevails now. May Allah forgive us and guide us to get out of this state of mind. Now, how did the Prophet ﷺ solve this dispute? He didn't go, he did get involved in the petty details. He did not even go and investigate who did what, why, who did it first, etc. He just said, leave it. So what is the lesson we learn? For some disputes, we don't need to go into details about what happened, who said this, who said first, etc., etc. You need to use a lot of wisdom. The Prophet ﷺ just said, leave it. And just by this expression, they were made to feel foolish amongst themselves. How could you go about these things? Come on, forget it. You're all brothers. Bismillah, let's move on. And then what happens? The matter is forgotten. So there's no point in going into detailed investigation in all these petty matters. We now come to how the munafiqun where Abdullah ibn Ubay exposes his own true self. He shows what he really is. When he heard of this dispute between the Ansari and the Muhajir, and he heard that this had become resolved, he got angry. On seeing the division amongst the Muslims, he was waiting for an opportunity for something like this to take place so he can contribute to worsening the situation. But when the fitna was quelled, what happened? He became furious. He got irritated. Why is it that these Muslims are getting together? Please, please, as you're hearing this, think of what is happening nowadays. Who are the people who are taking advantage of this division amongst the Muslims? It's very, very clear. What did Abdullah ibn Abay do? He mentioned about the Mahajirun who had come from Mecca and settled down in Medina, he used some very vulgar Arabic expressions. And comparing the Muhajirun and their leader, which is the Prophet Wasallam, they're comparing to dogs. He declared that once they returned to Medina, they were on the campaign, he said once they returned to Medina, his own people, what he said was, he will expel the Muhajirun. Can you imagine? He started blaming his own people for allowing them to, not only allowing these Muhajirs to come to Medina, but also giving them money and sharing their wealth. Now, see how he tried to trick them out. How he tried to increase, uh, increase this enmity. In this, we find the role of Zaid ibn Arkham. What did he do? While Abdullah ibn Abay was saying all this in his private tent, he did not go and declare it publicly. Why? He's a hypocrite. He shows something in one side and something at the other side. While he was saying this privately in his tent among his people, where the majority were munafikun, there was a young guy named Zaid bin Arkham. He was having a lot of iman. And he was listening to this. He rushed to his uncle and he told his uncle, I have heard such and such a thing. And the uncle immediately took him to the Prophet ﷺ and the young boy told the Prophet ﷺ all that had taken place. And what exactly this man, Abdullah ibn Ubayy said. Now, what happened was, the Prophet immediately called Abdullah ibn Ubayy. And he asked him, did you just say this? 
Abdullah ibn Bagoy started giving one oath after the other. He said, no, I did not say this. And he started making excuses. Did the Prophet ﷺ get angry? Did the Prophet ﷺ say, you hey, know, you're a liar? No. What did he do? He accepted this excuse of Abdullah ibn Ubay and he took no action at all. Just observe this. After Abdullah ibn Ubay left, Umar anhu, he came here and he said, Ya Rasulullah, let me get rid of this fellow. The Muslims know that he's a munafiq. How did the Prophet ﷺ reply? He said, leave him. Don't kill him. Because I don't want people to say that Muhammad killed his own companion. This was the impression that everybody was having. Instead, what did the Prophet do? He immediately ordered all the Sahaba who were outside Medina. He said, pack up their bags and rush back to Medina. They were still very far from Medina. And what did he do? He made them march non-stop all the way to Medina without doing anything on the way. It took nearly about 20 hours straight for them to reach Medina, a little outside Medina. And after this long and tedious travel, once they reached the borders of Medina, outside Medina, they were so tired that they fell asleep. Now look at the wisdom behind the Prophet in this action that he did. Why did he do this? He kept them occupied in other things to such an extent that they did not even have time to think of what had taken place. To stop all the gossips and to forget everything that had taken place. And it's human nature for gossiping. Once an opportunity comes, gossiping and chit-chatting takes the front place. So what the Prophet did was, he stopped all this by keeping them occupied and for 20 hours straight. But after this also, there were tensions between the, uh, between the Munafiq and the Ansar of Medina. Because of what he did, the trick that he played. Now, what happened to, can we have the next slide, please? What happened to Zaid ibn Arkham? He got very depressed. A young boy, he says, it's the worst day of my life. I have told the Prophet ﷺ what exactly happened. And the Prophet ﷺ had essentially rejected his testimony and believed the munafiq. He was very upset and, and he was depressed. It was at this time that the revelation of Surah Munafiqun started. Subhanallah. Right that morning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the entirety of the Surah Al Munafiqun. Can you just see? The Surah, surah Munafiqun, the first ayahs one and two, was revealed first. And as this was continued, Allah specifically refers to. The what exactly the uh, Abdullah ibn Ubay said in surah, in ayah number 9 of the same surah. The whole surah is criticism of the munafiqun and it is exposing the faults of the munafiqun. I would like you to go through these three ayahs specifically and then have a look at the uh, other ayahs with their meanings to know the extent with which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has addressed the munafiqun and their trickery. Another thing I would like you to draw your attention to. In Surah Fatiha, we have this Ehdina Surat al-Mustaqim, guide us. The very next Surah, Surah al-Baqarah, says, the first ayah says, the conditions for those who require guidance. The first five ayah of Surah Bakra reveal the conditions that are required for those who want to be guided. The sixth ayah is just one ayah who talks about, which talks about the disbelievers. And then can you imagine about the next 12 ayahs talks specifically of the munafiqun, the characteristics of the munafiqun, the characteristics of the hypocrites. How beautiful 
at the very beginning in the Quran, you are introduced to the type of people that you're likely to meet in your life. One is the believers, next is the disbelievers, and the third, the worst of them is the hypocrites. I would like you all to go through the details of this ayah. And so beautifully, it gives the details of the type of people whom we are going to meet among the hypocrites. And once we know about these characteristics, we should always make an attempt to avoid these people and not fall, fall into a trap of whatever they say. Now, when Zaid got very depressed, what did the Prophet ﷺ do? He went up and cheered Ibn Arkham. What did he do? He called Zaid, held him by the ear, and said, Allah has confirmed that this, he hold, told, referred to the ear, the ear which I am holding has heard the truth. SubhanAllah. Can you imagine? The Prophet ﷺ calms him down, cheers him up and says, what you heard is the truth and this is the ayah of it. What was the reaction of uh, Abdullah, the son of Abdullah ibn Ubay? Can you imagine his own son had become a Muslim? The news spread in Madina of whatever had happened. And since they were all still not entering Madina, when the army came, towards the borders of uh, Madina, a crier, an announcer would come to or tell the people that the army is going to enter Madina. And he would bring all the information. So this news about Abdullah ibn Ubay spread all together. And his son heard of this. He went outside of Madina. He met the Prophet wasalam, and told him, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it has reached me that you are considering to execute my father. If you command someone else to do it, I don't think I can see that man walking around in Madina, except that I will kill him in return out of anger. Because it's his own father. And then he continues to say, and I, then I will go to Jah Jahannam for killing a Muslim. So, he tells the Prophet them, you should command me to do the execution. Can you imagine? Subhanallah, he's so worried about going to Jahannam and not about his father's reputation. And he's seeing me, he's telling the Prophet them, give me the command and I will kill my own father. This is the real sign of obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say? He said, no, rather your duty is to be a good companion to him. On the one hand, the hypocrite behaves this way. On the other hand, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is guiding in this particular way. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam promised him, we shall be good and gentle with him as long as he lives with us. When he got this news, he was relieved. But he was still very angry with his father. He stood at the gate of Madina waiting for his father to come. And when his father came, he said, told his father, you were the one who said, if we return to Madina, the, honor, the, uh, the honorable will definitely expel the inferior, which means the hypocrites are going to expel the muhajis. But wallahi, if I won't allow you to come back to Madina until the Prophet gives the permission. He says, you can't come until the Prophet gives you the permission to enter. And ultimately, the Prophet allowed him to enter Madina. So the main outcome of this incident was the, the true nature of Abdullah ibn Ubay. It was fully exposed. His true colors were shown now. In spite of all the ayah that was revealed earlier at the Battle of Badr, at the Battle of Uhud, etc., now the final thing is shown. The complete veil is removed from the hypocrites. They're exposed completely. What happened? Many of the munafiqun Looking at this person's behavior, they left him and became Muslims. SubhanAllah. 
And it was then that Prophet Sallallahu later he remarked to Umar and who, what do you think, O Umar? For indeed, if I had commanded him to be killed the day that you told me to kill him, I would have turned many people away who know who have followed Islam. They would not have had that opportunity to accept Islam. You wanted to kill him, but what do you think now? Many of the Munafiqun have embraced Islam. If I had killed him, they would all have remained Munafiqs only. Their Iman had increased and they are true believers now. Umar Razilullah who responded, Wallahi, I know the opinion of the Prophet is always more blessed than mine. We come to Jabir ibn Abdullah Razilatala Anhu. He was a young man from the Ansar. His father, Abdullah, had been martyred in the Battle of Uhud. He, he was a senior Ansari and a companion to the Prophet. This boy Jabir was the eldest of the children of Abdullah. He had seven siblings, all of them girls, younger sisters. When Abdullah was going to fight in the Battle of Uhud, he told his son, Jabir, nothing would please me more than for you to fight by my side. Both of us fight side by side of the Prophet وسلم, in the Battle of Uhud. But one of us has to be remain back in Medina to look after your sisters. I will go to the war. You stay back and you look after your sisters. So Abdullah ended up falling as a shaheed. Jabir was devastated at his father's death. And the Prophet ﷺ consoled him, saying that your father is in paradise. And he was presented before Allah. Allah asked your father, is there anything that you want? Abdullah said, oh Allah, give me another life and I will once again give my life to you. SubhanAllah. The Prophet ﷺ continued, from the moment that your father's body fell in the battlefield at the time, to the time that we reached the body, Allah did not even allow the sun to hit your father's body. Angels were covering him with their wings, shielding his body from the sunlight. Now, Jabir lost his father and he has to look after his seven younger siblings. He came to the Prophet and he was feeling overwhelmed. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I just need to talk to someone. My father had debt. I have seven younger siblings. I went from one day with my father taking care of me and the next day I have to take care of the entire family. And I'm still dealing with the grief of the death of my father. The Prophet knew all of this. He also knew that Jabir was trying to get married also. So how did the Prophet ﷺ help him? Jabir was with the Prophet ﷺ on one of the campaigns. He had a she-camel. And he brought this for transportation. He wanted to use the she-camel for transport. The camel was very weak and frail. Whenever they would stop, and the army started moving, everyone would go ahead and he was left behind with this camel because he could not move fast. And also observe the habit of the Prophet ﷺ was that he was a caretaker of his people. He did not march right in front of the army. Like many of the victorious leaders and all these people would do, they want to boast that we are the leaders. What the Prophet ﷺ would do was, he would travel to the back of the army, making sure that nobody was left behind. He saw Jabir, who was slowly following the army, and he was quite behind the army, to the point that the only person traveling behind Jabir was the Prophet ﷺ. Jabir himself narrated, I wasn't aware that I had gotten so close to the Prophet ﷺ, all of a sudden, it felt like someone was tapping my camel on the back and kind of giving it a command, go, go, go. I turned to look around and it was the Prophet ﷺ smiling at me. The Prophet ﷺ had a stick and he was using it to lightly tap my camel to encourage to go. 
This was a miracle of the Prophet ﷺ when he tapped my camel and said, go, go. My camel then felt like a turbo kitten. It started to run so fast that I passed everybody. Now look at the attitude of the Prophet ﷺ, how he was dealing with each situation. He was doing it in a playful manner, but still look at the way it all happened. After a while, what happened was the Prophet ﷺ caught up with Jabir and started talking to him. And he said, uh, yeah, Jabir, your camel's looking good. It's a nice camel. So will you sell it to me? Jabir says, I gift it to you, Ya Rasulullah ﷺ. To which the Prophet responded, no, absolutely not. You have to sell it to me. Look at the playful joking between the Prophet ﷺ and, the, and Jabir. Jabir said, okay, name your price. What are you willing to offer me? The Prophet ﷺ said, I will buy it for one dirham. He said, Ya Rasulullah, now you're just trying to rip me off. It's not, it can't be just one dirham. The Prophet ﷺ said, okay, two dirham. He replied, no, that's too cheap. In this manner, just observe, the Prophet ﷺ kept on increasing the price until he got to a gram of gold. At that time, it was quite a big price. And still they were engaging in a playful manner. And Jabir narrated, I just figured that this was like a game of fun and games. After a while, the conversation went on. The Prophet ﷺ asked him, Yeah, Jabir, did you finally end up getting married? He says, Yes, I did get married. I married an older woman, a woman who was married previously. To which the Prophet ﷺ asked, Jabir, why didn't you marry a younger woman? You're still a kid. You have a lot of youthful energy. Jabir replied, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I have seven younger sisters that I am responsible for. I didn't want to add an eighth one that I would have to take care of. I married a woman who can help me to raise them. I need a mature, responsible woman who can even take care of me while I take care of the seven of them. The Prophet said, you've made a very good decision. It's a very smart decision. All these incidents, all these words have a lesson for us. It's a very big lesson for us. And then what was the sunnah that the Prophet taught Jabir? When the RB arrived back to the city of Madina during, on the following day, the Prophet ﷺ was teaching Jabir. He said, listen, before you go, before you enter outside, uh, from outside back to your home, you, it is suggested to offer two rakat sunnah. Jabir agreed to do so and he went to the masjid to pray. When the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba got to the masjid, the Prophet ﷺ told Jabir, the Prophet ﷺ told Jabir, I purchased your camel from you. Don't you remember that? Leave your camel outside the masjid. I will take it. After that, what did the Prophet ﷺ do? He sent either Bilal or Uthman to get an amount of gold that the Prophet had promised to Jabir. And they came and handed over the gold to uh, the Prophet who gave it to Jabir. Jabir took the gold and he went home. After a little while, the Prophet ﷺ said to Jabir, uh, said to ask the people, where, where, are, where is Jabir? They said he went home. The Prophet ﷺ, go get him now. When Jabir came back to the masjid, the Prophet ﷺ said, you, oh son of my brother, you forgot your camel. It's still here. Jabir was stunned. He said, I gave you the camel, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You have given me the gold. So I have got the gold. So why should I leave the camel? Why should I take the camel? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, no, no, take the camel home and also keep the gold. Look at the playful attitude and the way the Prophet ﷺ was helping Jabir. 
because he knew that this young man was taking care of a whole family and he had just got married. This was the affection, the love, the kindness and generosity of the Prophet ﷺ. In our times, we get obsessed with authority. I am in charge. I have a rank over you. I have such and such a position. I am great. We are always preoccupied or concerned about exerting and establishing and reminding people about authority. And always saying, hey, who's in charge? Keep this in mind. I'm in charge. That's not how the Prophet ﷺ operated. He had more authority than any human being ever had. He was the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that the Prophet ﷺ was so soft. He was so adjustable. And he was so accommodating to them. If he had been harsh and strict because of the authority he was given, people would have left him long ago. But it is because of this aspect, the attitude of the Prophet ﷺ, that people were ready to be at his side and they were ready to give their lives for the sake of the Prophet ﷺ. Can we have the next slide, please? The Prophet ﷺ's marriage to Juwaira bin al harith one more of the mother of the believers was Juwaira bin al harith the daughter of the chieftain of the Banu al Mustalik. Juwaira was captured and she was given to an Ansari named Thabit ibn Khais ibn Shams. She agreed with Thabit to purchase her own freedom. Slaves can purchase their own freedom. If you go to Surah An Nur, uh, Surah number 24, Ayah number 33, and let those who find not the financial means of marriage for marriage keep themselves chaste until Allah enriches them of his bounty, and such of your slaves as seek a writing, give them such a writing. That is to leave them free. If you know that they are good and trustworthy and give them something of your, uh, something from yourselves out of the wealth of Allah which he has bestowed upon you. Force not your maids to prostitution if they desire chastity in order that you may make a gain in the goods of this worldly life. But if anyone compels them to such a thing, then after such compulsion, Allah is oft forgiving, most merciful. Subhanallah. Juwaira was the daughter of the chieftain, as I mentioned before, and she did not want to remain a slave. So she immediately negotiated and arranged to free herself. She came knocking on the door of the Prophet Sallallahu that is to Aisha's house, asking for monetary help to get her freedom. Aisha Razalotala Anha says she was very sweet and she was very beautiful and no one saw her except that he was captivated by her beauty. She was so beautiful. So Juwaira told the Aisha Razalotala Anha that she wants to ask the Prophet to give her something so that she can get her freedom. And Aisha Razalotala Anha, after seeing her, she started hating her because she knew what the Prophet ﷺ would do now. Juwaira introduced herself to the Prophet ﷺ and said, I am the daughter of the chieftain of my tribe and you have seen what has happened to me. I have arranged to free myself from Thabit, so please help me in this matter. The Prophet ﷺ said, what if I give you something better? I will free you myself and I will marry you. She agreed to this. And the meher that she got was her freedom. Look at this aspect of it. And when this happened, what was the reaction of the Ansars? The news spread amongst the Ansar that the Prophet ﷺ had married a slave after freeing her. So they said, how can we have the in-laws of the Prophet ﷺ as our slaves. So one by one, they started 
freeing, uh, freeing every single captive that they had, ultimately all the women were freed to the last person. Her father, Al Harith, he came to Medina with the intention of negotiating a ransom from the people to take his daughter back. He didn't know what had happened. The Prophet ﷺ told her, told him, it's her decision. She can go back if she wants, or she can remain here. Of course, Javeria Rasulatallah and her willingly chose the Prophet ﷺ over her own father. And when her father saw this, he willingly left her, left the place, and he was so affected that he embraced Islam. And when he goes back to his place, he tells the entire tribe as to what happened. And subhanAllah, the entire tribe followed their chief and they also accept Islam. They are in the status quo now, but they all are Muslims. Juwaria was known for her piety, her fasting, and her generosity. Once the Prophet ﷺ visited her on Friday and she was fasting. He asked her, did you fast the day before or intend to fast the day after this? She said, no, I'm just fasting today on Friday. Then he gave her a Sharia ruling, which we all adopt now. In that case, do not choose only Friday as a day of fasting. If you want to fast on a Friday, fast also a day prior or a day after the Friday. Join it with something. Also, one time the Prophet ﷺ went to pray Fajr from Juwaria's house and she was in the uh, Musalla where she was praying, doing dhikr. He returned later in the middle of the day and she fo he found her sitting there in the exact place doing dhikr. So what was the morning dhikr that the Prophet ﷺ taught her? He asked her, have you remained in the same place since Fajr? She said, yes. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, should I not tell you of a dhikr that if you do it, it will give you all of the reward what you have done? And he taught her a beautiful dhikr to be done with sincerity. Next slide, please. Here is the dhikr. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi adada khalqihi virida nafsihi wa zinata arshihi wa midada kalimati. Perfection and praise to Allah, as much as the number of his creation, as much as pleases him, as much as the weight of his throne, and as much as his words are. SubhanAllah. We are asked to do the dhikr three times immediately after our dhikr in Fajr Salah. And this is taken like as if the person has done dhikr till the afternoon period. Juwaria Rasulullah lived a relatively long life. She died at around 65 years in the 50th year of the Hijrah. And in the duas that I have included today, we are ending the session today, but in the duas that I have included today is a dua asking Allah to cleanse our hearts from hypocrisy. Let us go to the dua, please. Allahumma tahir khalbi min al-nifaq wa amali min al-riyah wa lisani min al-kadib wa aini min al-khiyana fa inna ka ta'alumu khainatu al-a'yuni wa ma tukhra sudur O Allah, purify, clean my heart from hypocrisy and my actions from showing up, from riyah my tongue from lying and my eyes from treachery. Why is the word treachery used where eyes are concerned? Just recall and see, these eyes are a gift and a blessing from Allah. And what do our eyes do? Knowingly, unknowingly, they cast themselves on the wrong times, at the wrong people, at the wrong occasions. Even though we may not be thinking of it, still the eyes keep wandering. 
And when the eyes go against what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the eyes for, it is called treachery. Can you imagine? Sometimes even you will not know what your eyes are doing. But Allah says, I know. Because here you say, indeed, Allah, you know the treachery of the eyes and what is hidden in our chest. What is the type of niya with which we are going to look with our eyes? On the joking side, Allah, the Prophet said, you can look at a person only once and then turn away. What do we do? We look once, but we keep on looking for a longer time to keep up to this one. But also imagine, knowingly, unknowingly, whatever our eyes do, Allah is aware of that. And how very careful we should be because we are answerable to Allah because he says, you are doing treachery to the eyes which he has blessed us with. May Allah guide us to what is correct. Amen. Next dua, please. Allahumma j'alni sabura waj'alni shakura waj'alni fi aini sabira this is a beautiful dua to kill our egos, to kill our arrogance. Oh Allah, make me very patient. Make me very thankful. And make me feel small in my own eyes. Let me not think I'm great myself. But in the eyes of the people, make me look big. Subhanallah. Next dua, please. Rabbana firlana dunubana wa israfana fi amrina wa thabbit afdamana wa ansurna ala al kafirin. Yes, please. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.